Hello everyone, as I promised, I will make these short, quick and dirty summaries of the podcast episodes in English. Let's get right into it. Last time we talked about Rousseau, and we talked about a question that was relevant then and is still relevant now, and the question is this. Does science and everything understood to follow from science, so think of also technology and um, new practices and new ways of being, does science lead to moral progress? Now, you see, that was relevant then because this was in the middle of the Enlightenment period and people were uh, very enthusiastic about the new achievements of science. What we might call uh, industrial revolution had not yet begun, but we were close. We were fairly close. So, of course, um, the Academy of Dijon, who launched this um, competition of essays, to which Rousseau participated, um, the Academy of Dijon expected um, many beautiful answers um, that science does lead to moral progress and then science makes us better people. And Rousseau um, disagreed, so it was a very interesting move from him. But again, it's the question is relevant today as well. We have to ask ourselves, well, we don't have to, but we can ask ourselves, does science Despite all its benefits, you know, we're not questioning the ability of science to, or scientists, to solve problems and to create solutions, practical, technical solutions to problems. So we're not questioning the um, existence of benefits from science, but is that a form of moral progress? Is our moral judgment better? Is our moral character better? because of science or if not what's the relationship between science and morality is our moral judgment and moral character worse this is what uh, Rousseau was writing about uh, a few words about Rousseau although if you want to know more of course just ask uh, chat GPT Rousseau was born in uh, 1712 in Geneva and I think that is very important and I insist on it because in a sense, his political writings were directed at, let's say, popularizing or promoting what was happening in Geneva. Geneva was a small republic, a small Calvinist republic, surrounded by Catholic monarchies. So, Rousseau saw, interesting phonetics there, Rousseau saw Geneva as the closest you can get to an ideal of liberty and public participation in politics and he wrote his best known work which is the social contract i'm not going to talk about the social contract today because i just want to deal with that question of science and morality but he wrote that social contract with the idea of implementing what he had seen in geneva and making other places on earth such as france where he moved eventually more like geneva uh, this is not uh, uncommon for philosophers to write um, based on a background they know from childhood. We know this, for example, from uh, Aristotle as well. His politics is very much influenced by his uh, childhood. Okay, now uh, Rousseau is, of course, um, very much known for the book called On the Social Contract. And we will talk about that uh, in the next episode. And, um, well, he moved to, to Paris eventually and um, was engaged in the encyclopedic movement. So these were people, self-styled philosophers, philosophes in, in French. And he participated in this movement. And the reason why it was called encyclopedic was because they were writing an encyclopedia. So there you go. The title says it. And um, their ambition was to gather all knowledge and to put it into um, one big book. Well, technically it was 17 smaller books, but one big work that would contain everything. And that's the encyclopedia. So these were the encyclopedists. But um, very soon uh, in his participation in this Enlightenment movement, Rousseau realized that he was a dissident. He was not 
um, in line with uh, militant rationalism. He distrusted um, the whole um, optimism of the Enlightenment. And he, because of all this, he became the first, well, he didn't become the first, but he came to be seen as one of the first romantics. Because after the Enlightenment and this positive, optimistic, militant um, view of the world and our knowledge, after the Enlightenment came Romanticism. And Romanticism is a bit pessimistic, is a bit dark, and it's a bit, I don't know, man, uh, with regard to science. And Rousseau was a bit like that. Um, a couple more things. He was also well known for um, other writings, not just political writings. So he wrote on music a lot, and he composed music. He even invented a new musical uh, notation style. And he wrote, of course, Emile, which is a, an essay, a book about uh, education. And in this book, because he thought what's in us by nature is good and civilization eventually degrades that one way or the other, in this book, he set the, uh, the, the tone for what was to become the modern approach to parenting. Um, kids were not to be seen as just furniture to be put and done with as you wish. Kids are in fact, maybe in some sense, better than us. Their, their morality and their sense of, of what's right and what's wrong is the natural morality that everybody would have um, if we had uh, missed the whole, you know, civilization thing. So um, Emile was very modern from a parenting point of view and was very fair to the kids and was very, um, how do you say that, um, maybe liberal in a sense or, or, or allowing a lot of liberty to kids. I'm not sure what the exact word would be. Um, there's, a, there's a quote from there. Uh, and it's actually the beginning uh, sentence of Emile and it goes like this. Everything is good when it springs from the hands of our creator. Everything degenerates when shaped by the hands of man. So you can imagine that something that starts like that can only praise and admire the goodness and the naturalness of children. Okay, he got into trouble because of his work, The Social Contract, not because of the political uh, statements there, but because some statements about a religious freedom. And then he... He started, he left Paris and he left France and uh, started traveling, thinking that everybody was out to get him and to kill him and all that. And he died in 1789 um, alone and uh, rather psychotic. So, uh, no, sorry, he died earlier. Uh, this is, oh, he died in 1778. So he missed the French uh, Revolution that was to uh, start in 1789. He died at uh, 66 years old, convinced that uh, his former philosophe friends were out to get him. Okay, so uh, while he was in France, not yet a uh, rebel, while he was in France, he read in a newspaper that was called Mercure de France, he read a, an announcement about a, a competition of essays on the question of whether the re-establishment of the sciences and the arts, and by arts it is usually meant crafts and what we would call engineering um, has contributed to a purification of the morals so what what I introduced in the beginning as whether science makes us morally better um, Rousseau reads this and has an epiphany has a, a, a fit he barely he can barely stand and what he realized he says in his confessions he also wrote an Augustinian type of confessions and what he says is that he saw a different universe and he became a different man now what he realized was that man in uh, the state of nature remember that this idea of the state of nature was very popular back then uh, that man in the state of nature is in fact not only good but better off this was quite revolutionary. If you think about Hobbes, um, man in a state of nature is, the life is solitary, what was the expression? Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. That's how Hobbes described the state of nature. Locke admits that maybe on 
some levels the state of nature is good, but you're always afraid and your property is never safe in the state of nature. Um, Rousseau thinks that uh, people were better off in the state of nature. And he insists, not because people were better. Human nature is human nature. You're going to have vices. You're going to have uh, temptations. But because there was more transparency. Everything that came afterwards, science, civilization, arts, morals, um, moral rules, politeness, fashion, everything is... Uh, uh, gets between people and um, adds complications to the natural, true relationship between people. So it's not that people were better, but that there was more transparency. And if you think about, let's say, um, makeup or fashion or plastic surgeries, this would be examples, of, rather extreme examples, of literally hiding the true person, literally hiding the other individual. So people used to see through each other, and that made them less um, prone to vices. So this was Rousseau's big revelation. This was Rousseau's big realization. Um, and then um, Rousseau also makes some historical arguments. He starts first with Socrates. If you remember uh, from Socrates' uh, apology, so the, the dialogue in which... Socrates uh, defends himself before the Greek um, jury. Socrates was one of the first ones to, in a sense, praise ignorance over what society calls wisdom. Because he says, well, look at all these people that, according to society, know better. And what you realize is that they just know more. They're just hyper-specialized. But that doesn't mean that they possess wisdom. That doesn't mean that they are they know what virtue is and that they have true indubitable knowledge and that they are better people. So he uses that a couple of paragraphs from uh, Socrates' dialogue, well, let's say Plato's dialogue, Socrates' defense, and then talks about the contagion of useless knowledge. So he attacks basically specialized knowledge. He attacks the idea of specializing and this, this um, replacement of the idea of wisdom with the idea of specialized uh, knowledge. And this triggers a um, series of historical arguments. He looks at um, the Greek civilization. He looks at the Egyptians, um, Holy Roman Empire. He looks at the German people. And he says every time the, um, the people is left alone, so to speak, the people is not um, inclined to create what we would call culture and science and knowledge, and there's not this differentiation between the highly specialized and the ignorant, every time you're in this basic natural state, um, the country or the state or the people just fares better. And then, so he, he adds these arguments. He starts with the idea that the, the starting point is good, the state of nature is good, and he adds the... A couple of quotes from Socrates and he adds the um, historical arguments but then it seems that there's almost an economic argument involved here because he says at one point that maybe not science as such so maybe not the hyper specialization as such but the fact that you are wasting your time with this specialized knowledge he says the waste of time is certainly a great evil. And there's this passage where he enumerates a bunch of recent discoveries from science. Um, you know, we know how to calculate the revolution of the planets. We know how to calculate speed and all these uh, interesting specialized calculation calculations from physics. And he says, okay, tell me, are we better? Uh, are we more... Are we better governed? Are we more formidable? Are we less perverted because we know this? So he he makes a bit of an uh, what is called an a fortiori uh, argument. So he pushes and takes an, as an example the the pinnacle of science. What was the pinnacle of science then? And he says, yeah, how does this contribute to our moral well-being? How does this make us better people? Um. And you have to you have to 
appreciate his strategy. I mean, whether you agree or not, let me know in the comment section. But it's an interesting strategy because there's not a real obvious connection between knowing how to calculate vectors in a, in a physical space and just being a better person, uh, you know, taking care of the poor and the suffering and being happy and being kind and all that. You have to give it, a, it's, a, it's a good angle to go. Take the most specialized knowledge, cutting edge uh, knowledge, and then compare it to something that is so far away, which is basic, simple kindness, basic, simple moral action. And then, um, by the way, the essay is not that long. It's about, I think, 20 pages long, so maybe a bit more. But you can definitely find it online and read it because it's rhetorically very well written. It's super disorganized, and by the way, Rousseau eventually came to dislike it. But um, it's, it's a nice, interesting uh, essay. And then he says, you know, the problem is also that we, we start very early on. We teach this to kids. We teach science. We teach biology. We teach chemistry. And then he says, uh, let me try to translate this because I quoted in Romanian. He basically says, the basic values, uh, courage, humanity, moderate, moderation, equity, justice, these are not the focus of our attention. We don't teach this. We teach specialized knowledge. We teach calculations. We teach uh, arithmetic, geometry, medicine, and all, well, medicine barely existed at that time, but um, we teach specialized knowledge. And so for the pupil, for the child, I quote, the question is no longer whether a man is honest, but whether he is clever. So we, we, we sent this message, maybe implicitly, that the best thing to do is to be clever. To become clever, to become intelligent, to, to succeed in knowing more, to take part of this game of specializations. Of, of not specializations, of becoming more specialized, you see what I'm saying. Um, and finally, at the very end, this is why I said that the, the, the essay is kind of disorganized, but the, because the, the, the main thesis seems to change a bit as you read along. He says, well, it's not so much that scientific knowledge is in itself bad but that there's so many we, we we've made it a mass form of education there's so many people practicing science and this kind of applies today as well um, again it's up to you to disagree with it i'm not saying it's true but i'm saying this kind of reasoning still applies there's so many scientists out there and if the if the work of the best of them is not immediately connected to our moral well-being, what are we to say about the work of the all the rest? You know, the, the hordes and hordes of groups, big, uh, chunky populations of science, scientists that are working to um, no immediate uh, moral goal. So now the thesis changed a bit. You see, it's not so much that science or arts or civilization is wrong, but th the fact that everybody's practicing it and that we made it our main form of knowledge. And then there's an ambulance. So at one point he mentions something that is, again, very rhetorically uh, well chosen. He says, well, you know, Bacon, Descartes and Newton, those are not the products of uh, the education system. They didn't have professors themselves. So he, the idea being, well, maybe we should leave science to the very few that happen to be amazing and that happen to be geniuses in this um, area. So yeah, you can imagine that um, uh, uh, ideas such as these will be very, and they have been very problematic in, uh, in that time, in a period where everybody was saluting the, the, the big achievements of science and everybody was quite enthusiastic about the future so i think the the usefulness of this uh, essay is that it forces us to see a bit what i said in the beginning it forces us to see that there's no clear self-evident connection between scientific knowledge of, or specialization of any kind also think of crafts and engineering there's no clear self-evident line between that and moral progress. 
In short, it's not at all self-evident that if you know more, you are a better person. It's not at all self-evident that if you're, uh, you have a, a, a diploma of sorts, that you are capable of making better moral judgments. This is Rousseau's idea. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe he's right. Let me know in the comments below. And make sure to like and subscribe this video if you want me to keep making these uh, summaries in English. And I will see you next time. Thank you.